Let the culling games begin. We've actually made it to the start of the most insane saga so far. Always gotta say so far, cause who knows when the GOAT, Father Gige, will drop his next masterpiece. This saga here makes Shibuya feel like the prelude it's made out to be by the mastermind himself, Kenjaku. Everything to do with the Culling Games has taken what we know with Jujutsu Kaisen and absolutely flipped it on its head. But firstly, just before I do dive into Gege's nut intertwined sensation of a story, I'm going to be doing something slightly different here with this arc. Pretty much, and like I've said, due to the fact that this is more or less going to evolve into its own kind of saga, I'm going to break down each respective colony as its own arc, starting with the first, Tokyo Colony. Just before we do get into that though, if you are new around here and want to watch more stuff just like this, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video, as it really helps out with pushing my content to a bunch of new amazing people. But anyway, enough of that, sit back and relax as we jump back into Jujutsu Kaisen. So as we start back out, we find ourselves in the middle of a Japanese criminal trial. It's explained that in Japan, 99% of criminal trials end in a guilty verdict. A young man sitting opposite the newest Chi, Higuruma, who I introduced right at the end of the last video, explains that he had a cat who was lost, and while looking for it, he was confronted by the Popos. Being struck with a difficult choice, the young man decided to flee because his cat would have died, as where he lives, it's a rule that he can't own any pets. We find that in March of 2016, a mother and daughter were both slain in Morioka City. This caused the prosecutors of the case to instantly suspect the young man. They arrested him and charged him with suspicion of murder and robbery. After Kisa fled the initial questioning by police officers, they followed him to his home and found a bloody blade. Which is like, bro, why have you got this knife, dude? It, it ain't exactly looking good for you here. Anyway, anyway, once the lab analysis was completed, it confirmed that the blood on the knife was matched to the DNA of the two victims. Despite the outstanding evidence and practically being caught red-handed by the cops, Kita insisted that he was innocent. While reviewing the case with his co-worker Shimizu, Higuruma explains that Kita told him he picked up the knife even though it wasn't his. Obviously Shimizu doesn't believe that that could have possibly happened and instead thinks that he fled from the authorities because he was simply guilty. Yet for some reason, Higuruma argues that he only fled because in the past he'd been illegally harassed by police officers, causing him to always be wary of them. He claims he was going to give the knife to the police later because his hostel was sketchy as hell and didn't allow him to call the police there. The reason for this is because his job around the hostel was to care for the elderly who have nowhere to go. Employees in the hostel are given a place to stay and some food, but are only paid money under the table on the new year, while at the same time still being overcharged each month for rent. Obviously, as you could imagine, this affects how all of the residents would live. More than a few of the residents who do live there have criminal records, and ever since the 2011 earthquake, relief fund money started pouring into the region, causing more shady, non-profit businesses to begin appearing. Higuruma believes it's likely that the weapon was actually lying around and Kita indeed is telling the truth. So while obviously Big Haruma is a freaking G, man is working on the higher cognitive frequency and is probably the only damn lawyer in Japan that is adamant and taking on the courts themselves, plus freaking Giga again adding in that 2011 tsunami slash earthquake reference there, I absolutely love how it makes us feel as though this could actually be going down in Japan right now, or he's retelling an event that actually affected the world over the past few years. Anyways, anyways, Higuruma forms a plan to take on the case, he'll continue gathering information while his overworked assistant takes care of pretty much every everything else. The sexy, big brain duo go ham, working tirelessly until the day of the trial. Then on the day, they somehow manage to earn an innocent verdict for Kita. Shimizu is surprised they actually got the verdict, but Higuruma knows the prosecutors will immediately appeal. In a post-trial meeting, Higuruma reveals to Kita that nothing from the robbery that was stolen was ever found in his room, and someone disappeared from the residence soon after the crime happened. Above everything else, Kita also appeared on a convenience store camera at literally the same time as the time of the death. Hearing this, he thanks Higuruma, but the lawyer simply emphasizes that there will be a second trial. Sobbing, Kita specifies that he means he just wants to thank Higuruma for believing in him. However, as per usual at the retrial, the broken Japanese judicial system unfortunately found Kita guilty and the young man was sentenced to life in prison. It's explained that independent defense lawyers like Higuruma rely on limited funding and no workforce. Public prosecutors have access to tax money and much greater manpower. Because of this, 
no new evidence was ever presented at the second trial and the court passed out his sentence on the shaky argument that there was no reason to suspect the random person who just happened to go missing straight after the murder. Which is like, nah dude, that, that guy straight up gapped it because he committed the murder and now you're completely locking up an innocent person here. Okay, anyway, because of this, a third trial before the highest court is unlikely, as they refuse to hear most cases. Getting a fair hearing is improbable and the system itself unfairly branded Keita as guilty from the very beginning. And sadly, this is just the reality of the situation in most countries, from the US to New Zealand. As soon as you have like been sat in front of the jury, you already have somewhat of a bad connotation put over your head. So like, moral of the story obviously is just don't get yourself in a situation where you're going to be charged with something in court. Obviously you can't always do that, but anyway. Desperate and angry, Keita looks at Higuruma with sorrow and disappointment in his eyes. Standing there shocked, Higuruma just asks himself why his clients always look at him this way. Losing touch with reality for a moment, he thinks back to a conversation he had about his mental state. There, he replied that it was his intention to save the weak. He's always been the type of person who couldn't just ignore things. Justice is supposed to be blind, and people close their eyes to spare themselves from the half-truths of reality. But even if he's the only one, Higuruma says that he wants to keep his eyes. Back in court now, the judge announces that if there are any objections, that they must be filed within 15 days. Not freaking happy though, and wanting to make a damn change, Higuruma abruptly interrupts and slams his table with a mallet that turns out to be a judge's gavel of his own. This leaves absolutely everyone in the courtroom surprised, and as Shizimu begins to move away, a large, dark curse begins to form behind Higuruma. Refusing to allow the trial to end in this unjust manner, Higuruma snaps and tells everybody that nobody is allowed to leave because now they are having a retrial. As per usual with Father Gege, we are skipping away from this straight away and going over elsewhere just before 6am back on the 1st of November. And we find ourselves with Kenjaku who is legit like creeping on Sasaki. By the way, just going to blow your minds if you guys haven't realised this as well. This is the freaking girl from the very first episode or chapter. Yuji's old friend, like the one that like he saved right at the beginning. So what the actual hell does Kenjaku have in store here like with her? Anyways, anyways, petrified as you would be with waking up and finding a man like in your bed, Setsu Ko asks who this weirdo is. It's explained to her that he is a sorcerer who placed a barrier over Sendai, and that the region has been chosen to host a lethal contest where players will fight to the death. The remains of an execution site nearby serves as the centre of the barrier, with a radius of around 5 to 6 kilometres. Which is super interesting, like I wonder if he had to set up a bunch of these like execution sites throughout each barrier in his thousand years or so preceding this event. Those at Sasaki who are already inside of the barrier are given one chance to leave. So this explains the confusion on how they were going to be like notified of the current situation with the barrier. He says that if she chooses to leave, she'll awaken outside of the barrier. Confused with his wording of just like everything, Sasaki questions if she's still dreaming, but Kenjaku replies that the space between dreams and reality is a curse. I don't know if this dude was the only one to show up personally to Sasaki, but he takes a hold of her hand and warns her to be careful. Then as he slowly guides her to the safety of the barrier exit, we get to witness the current carnage taking place across the battlefield. Then skipping back to the duo, just before they part ways for good, Kenjaku mysteriously thanks Sasaki for getting along with his son. Instantly after, she wakes up outside of the barrier with the other OG friend from the first chapter or episode, Aguchi, who's glad to have found someone that he knows. So it's always good to see Aguchi doing well again, as we left on the note that he was in hospital and everything. Anyway, he points out the gigantic barrier wall and explains that everyone saw the same man during their dream. However, to further go into my point on him physically meeting her unlike the others, Sasaki asks if the man had mentioned his son. But that isn't the case with him. Skipping away from that now and back to the present day, which is the 11th of November, Yuji and Megami continue planning for their part of the game. They're unable to find a player named Angel, but apparently they'll know who it is when they see them. Big Hikari decides that him and his boy Panda will go over the Tokyo 2 colony, while Yuji and Megami will head into the number 1, and Karara stays outside of the barrier. By the way, it's recently come to my attention that apparently Karara is neither a male or a female, so apologies for not realising that in the last video, but it does go to show just how like in touch Gege is, dude just knows everything that's going on with our culture and today's generations and all, and I absolutely love it. Anyway, Hikari plans to handle this mysterious Hajime Kushimo himself since they're the player with the most points and likely is the strongest. 
Yuji begins to bring up that perhaps he and Megami shouldn't travel together due to how Sakuna has been acting hella sus with him recently. However, Megami just tells Yuji to just shut up and stop being so self-centered because the others can't exactly change their roles. After a little squabble between the boys, it skips forth to 12pm the next day when everyone all reaches their designated barriers inside of Tokyo. Before entering, Kogan explains to them that inside the barriers, the lethal competition known as the Culling Game is taking place, and asks if the new players are willing to enter and declare their participation in the game. At probably the exact same time, Megami, Yuji, Panda and Hikari don't hesitate and all agree to enter. Diving straight into Tokyo Colony number 1, we find this babe, Hanyu, asking for a signal from a dude she's forcing to work for her called Rin. He tells her that he can't do anything though if no one shows up, which leaves Hanyu annoyed. She activates her curse technique, snapping her hair into this real, like, topaz looking jet on her back and threatens to run Rin over if he mouths her off again. Outside and approaching the colony, Megami explains to the absolutely confused Yuji that they just need to be wary of incarnated sorcerers that have lived throughout the past eras. Still somehow confused over this, Megami says that some of the players are from over a thousand years ago, and even those from only a hundred or two hundred years ago have a completely different mindset compared to the modern day ones. First and foremost, they are sorcerers who valued life differently, and fighting to the death was a normal thing for them. Some people even desire to achieve an honourable end in battle, and that's why Megami thinks they've agreed to become players, to achieve the warrior-like deaths they couldn't before. Megami doesn't believe that they'll be able to negotiate with past sorcerers, to which Yuji adds on that they need to be wary not of just people, but cursed spirits as well. They knock on the barrier wall of Tokyo Colony number 1, and immediately Kogain appears to greet them. It announces that the killing game is taking place inside, and anyone who enters will become a player in the deadly competition. Megami declares his participation, but oddly, like maybe you guys all saw, but Megami doesn't exactly pick up on it here, Kogain never asks Yuji if he actually wants to join the game. Determined to save his sister though, Megami reminds Yuji that their first move is to get information on Hiromi Higuruma. The duo steps inside the barrier, however, they're both suddenly separated, sent randomly to different locations inside of the colony. Yuji finds himself falling from the sky, confused by his circumstances, while also wondering where in the world Megami is. It's then explained to us that when a player enters the game's barrier, they're transferred to one of nine different locations. Certain individuals position themselves at those locations to literally spawn camp unsuspecting people who don't know this unspoken rule. Skipping back over to the simp who's actually just one of those spawn campers, he notices Yuji falling from the sky and uses a guiding light baton to signal Hanyu. Using her curse technique to propel herself, Hanyu bursts through the air, ramming directly into the chest of Yuji. She carries on and smashes him straight through two buildings with an attack that would have utterly pulverized most players. However, Yuji is just freaking built different, like man is constructed of a different material, and somehow he quickly recovers from the impact, surprising Hanyu. Sliding back across the roof of a building, Yuji manages to get some footing and takes his fighting stance. Recognizing her opponent's toughness, Hanyu calls her partner to her side, but Yuji quickly throws a rock he picked up in the previous attack that hits Hanyu in her stomach, seriously injuring her. Heavily injured, she slowly begins to lose altitude before falling into the building below her. Behind a surprised Yuji, Hanyu's partner, who's this like bulky ass dude called Haba, appears using his helicopter-like curse technique to levitate. He angrily demands to know what Yuji has done to his woman. Over on a nearby building, Rin notices that Haba has appeared and that Hanyu was easily taken down. Thinking on this newcomer for a second, Rin thinks that he might know him before remembering someone named Itadori. Meanwhile, Megami, who I, who I tell you ain't no simp, knocks down a female player and draws his curse tool. She asks him why he'd do that, but Megami angrily replies that it's because she literally attacked him. He asks this hella cute girl, like, oh my lord, that hairstyle is too freaking fire, like chill giga. Anyways, anyways, he asks her for info on Higuruma, but she instantly starts acting difficult. She says that she'll only give him the information if he acts as her knight and protects her. Reluctantly, our knight agrees, but not in the way she wants, which annoys her. He tells her to walk in front of her and only promises to protect her if she's telling the truth. If this isn't the case, he implies that he'll literally go demon time on her ass and get some points. Unlike Yuji, Megami literally does not care about racking up 100 points on his own if need be. Unintimidated though, the girl responds with a devious smirk and tells Megami to instead call her Remy. Back over the battle with Yuji, he begins his fight with Haba by tossing a stone charged with cursed energy directly at him. This doesn't pose much of a threat though as he easily destroys it with his fast rotating propeller. 
Seeing this, Yuji uses the opening to close the distance. He runs across the roof of the building and uses his cracked physical strength to leap into the air, grabbing his enemy's leg. He then flings his ass directly down and drags him through the side of the building, utterly destroying it. Hubba manages to get loose and tries counter-attacking, but Yuji sees it in time and decides to retreat. He realizes that Hubba isn't taking advantage of the high ground and only attacks with the weapon on his head. By the way, I just noticed, but both of the people Yuji has fought here so far have had some like weird ass obsession with turning their heads into some sort of like military vehicle. Like Hanyu's got her jet here and obviously this dude's got some kind of fetish for helicopters. Anyways, anyways, Yuji ends up leading this dude indoors where it's much more confined. However, Hubba instantly drops down after Yuji, confident that his propellers can literally shred through everything in sight. Finding him, Hubba spins towards his opponent head first like a drill, attempting to obliterate everything in his path. Thinking, Yuji believes that Hanyu was easily defeated because of her hair based technique that left the rest of her body unguarded by cursed energy. But no matter how tough it is, the head will always remain a vital spot. So as long as he can hit them without touching the propellers, Yuji is confident that he'll be able to destroy his opponent. As his adversary finally closes in, Yuji goes pure demon mode and punches Hubba directly in the top of the head, instantly stopping him in his tracks and leaving the bulked up dude bleeding from the top of his head. Still, despite his brain getting absolutely pinged around inside of his own skull, Hubba remains standing. He begins laughing and overconfidently assumes that Yuji had broken his hand. Then, just as he says that Yuji is finished, our boy just doesn't even care and casually finishes Hubba off with a kick, sending him flying back through the corridor. Standing there, shaking off the damage that he just took, Yuji realizes that he still needs to ask this man about Higuruma. Yet, as the confused Yuji goes to ask him, Rin suddenly appears behind him, saying that he knows about Higuruma and asks if Yuji actually remembers him. Rin, by the way, is just another random dude from like a sister school to Yuji's that Kenjaku has probably done the dirty with. He wasn't friends with Yuji, and Yuji, funnily enough, doesn't even recall who he is here. Rin notices that Yuji is obviously suspicious of him, so he says he really only knows him as the tiger of West Junior High, which embarrasses Yuji. Back with Megami, as he walks through the streets of the Remi, he asks her if she's not a sorcerer from the past. She confirms she's from the modern day, prompting Megami to question her reason for fighting. To which she explains that players who began inside the colony have been experiencing the culling game for 12 days already. She's not participating in the game to win. Most people like her are just trying to survive. Remy claims that she's seen players go mad with power and tells Megami to stop thinking in terms of time periods as it's pointless now. Hearing this, Megumi realizes that he accidentally misled Yuji with their plans earlier. Due to this, Megumi tells Remy to wait up and reveal where she's leading him. Instantly raging at him though, Remy refuses because Megumi could simply eliminate her after he gets this information, but he argues that he could lose Higuruma's location if Remy ends up dying. At the same time, Yuji asks Rin why he's helping, since he was just with the previous sorcerers, but Rin reveals he was being forced to work with them and would have been eliminated soon anyway. Hearing this, Yuji finally stops and asks where Higuruma is. Then in some pure cheekiness is revealed through Rin and Remy that Higuruma's location is in one of two different areas. So obviously one person is lying here. Rin claims Higuruma is in Ikibukuro, or Remy says that he's in Shinjuku. Having both gained this info separately, Yuji and Megami hope that the other is headed to the same destination. Yet, as we know, one of them is indeed being misled, and it's instead shown that someone is actually taking them to another mysterious but absolutely ripped man hoarding receipts. Skipping away for a second, we go into a flashback where we find Rin and another student who are approached by bullies. Big Brain Rin, using his like 1000 IQ, didn't stand up to the aggressors, but he knew how to act so that the bullies wouldn't get agitated and would instead stop bothering him. He knew the bullies were arrogant, despite not being smart or athletic, so he focused on staying out of their way. He always smiled and went with the flow, even at other people's expense, because nobody would bother him. However, in that same instance, how young legend refuses to sit by and watch someone else get bullied. Rin, who was just standing there, just assumed that another Morin had showed up who didn't know like how to avoid trouble, but it turned out to be the infamous Tiger of West Junior High, big freaking Yuji Itadori. The bullies attempted to beat on the newcomer, but all three of them are utterly fodderized and brutally knocked out just by a single hit each. Turning to Rin, Yuji asks if he's next, but Rin was just too shocked and could only stutter in response. Skipping back to reality and over with the two lovebirds as they head off at a station, Megumi immediately expresses some concerns about going through Ikibukuro. He believes that they should have taken a more direct route to Shinjuku instead, but Remy argues that the route is simple for her and she has a base nearby where she wants to rest and bathe. 
Meanwhile, Ren takes Yuji to a theater in Ikibukuro that Higuruma uses as his base. Excited to have quickly located his target, Yuji thanks Ren. Concerned though, Ren asks Yuji if he's really going to go inside alone, to which he says that he's in a hurry to meet up with an ally and assures Ren that he'll be able to escape if anything goes wrong. Yuji, like the happy moron he is, skips off into the theater without a care in the world, while Ren laments, sitting idly by, unable to stop him. After entering the theater and rolling down some stairs, someone else introduces himself as Reggie. But as per usual with Gige, and him skipping around all throughout this like section of the uh, arc right here, he's not greeting Yuji. No, in fact Megami has walked into an ambush of his own, inside of Remy's so called base, where another player was indeed waiting for him. Reggie reveals to Megami that Remy had tricked him, which immediately sends Megami into an utter rage. Pissed off, he looks back at Remy, who simply tries to taunt him now that she is supposedly safe. Not worried at all though, our female loving Megami tells her to shut up, then instantly summons his divine dog Totality, stating that they're wasting his time. Remember how Yuji was just surprised before this? Well, Yuji upon entering the theatre finds Higuruma chilling in a freaking bathtub filled with water while he's still fully clothed in his suit. But man, I love Higuruma, dude. Gets the coolest introductions and honestly looks so freaking clean here. I'm not sure what film as well this is from, but I know for a fact that this whole clothed and chilling in a bathtub is definitely from a movie that I've seen, but I just can't remember the exact one right now. Anyway, anyway, laying there in that Belle Delphine holy bath water, Higuruma claims that it feels better than he expected. We're just like, Holy dude, chill man. <laughs> he explains that he's going off the rails and doesn't care about anything anymore, so he's trying stuff he never thought he would have done in the past. Hearing him ramble, Yuji finds it kind of funny, but since he's the pro tag, he tries to get straight to the point and asks the suited man to talk, but the lawyer claims it costs 5,000 yen per every half hour. Higuruma says that this was just a joke though because he wanted to play the part of a greedy lawyer for once. Yuji, who's obviously like, yo, what the fuck is this dude on, quickly realizes that he's not an incarnated sorcerer from the past. To do our genius Itadori deducing this, he believes that they can communicate and make a deal instead of fighting. But you know, if you go off what Remy's saying, then right now Yuji is utterly stuffed either way and won't be able to talk. Anyways, anyways, Yuji reveals his and Megami's points plan, but hearing it, Higuruma declines because he believes the culling game presents a few possibilities he's interested in. So obviously our ex-lawyer has gone a little bit nuts here with a sudden power and wants to know more about the rules of the culling game in comparison to that of societies. Higuruma presents the question of what if the culling game punished rule breakers without charges, prosecutions or trials. We're fully in that law and order arc right now boys. Japan's rogue lawyer recognizes that the rules of the game aren't perfect, but he still wants to preserve the basic mechanics of the game and see the curse technique removal process for himself. Yuji, who's probably like, just chill man, tries to get Higuruma to understand that the culling game is a ritual for sacrificing everyone in Japan, but he just doesn't believe it. Instead, he points out that the culling game's rules celebrate permanence, something Yuji can't argue with because he literally doesn't even understand it himself. Running out of options and patience, Yuji, like the muscle head he is, opts for his own form of persuasion. Getting ready to throw some freaking hands, he demands that he let him use his points. However, soaking wet, just like myself after reading this arc, Higuruma stands up out of the tub and asks Yuji if he's ever killed anyone. Then armed with the gavel in his hand and his shikigami by his side, Higuruma claims that it feels better than he ever expected. Standing opposite him, Yuji knows Higuruma has eliminated at least 20 players. Because of this, he decides to stay on the defensive to anticipate an attack. Unexpectedly though, Yuji is caught off guard as Higuruma instantly activates his domain expansion, Deadly Sentencing. Noting the immediate danger, Yuji rushes the lawyer and tries to attack him before the curse technique can activate. Yuji throws a head kick but his foot slows and stops right before it can reach his opponent. Higuruma explains to him that his domain forbids the use of physical violence on each other, which causes Yuji to be transported back to the other end of his courtroom. Judgman, which is the name of the Shikigami, begins stating that Yuji is under suspicion of entering the pachinko parlor on July 16th, 2017 in Sendai City, despite being underage. Yuji isn't sure what's happening at first until he remembers the parlor the Judgman was referring to. As per usual, Yuji literally can't lie and makes it pretty obvious that he has been there. Higuruma explains that Judgman knows everything about everyone in the domain. It's explained that Higuruma isn't privy to all of this information beforehand and the verdict is solely decided by the arguments presented in this courtroom. Additionally, as a confused Yuji reacts to this, some evidence in a folder randomly appears that's been submitted by Judgman to be looked over. It's not necessarily conclusive, but our boy who physically like cannot lie won't be informed of what's inside either. 
Instead, his goal is to defend his case and dispel all doubts to win an innocent verdict from judgement. So yes, well you all thought the perfect preparation arc was crazy with some of the techniques like Remy's and how they all worked, but I can tell you for a fact that Father Gege was just warming up his holy pencil right there, like my brain writing these scripts sometimes and figuring out how these techniques exactly work is mental, everything just feels so well thought out with him. Anyways, anyways, this trial based curse technique makes Yuji realise that he's being prosecuted by an actual lawyer. The absence of a fatal attack in Higuruma's domain makes Yuji remember a past convo with the thumb, where he explained that a domain expansion was a more common technique for sorcerers of the past because they didn't incorporate guaranteed hits, which is different to today's, as I think so far throughout the series everyone who's cast a domain has had a sure hit guarantee. Old school domains used to be used in such a way to force people to obey specific conditions of their curse technique. Constructing a domain where they can't miss attack, like Dagon's or Jogo's for example, requires a lot of skill and the number of users with them heavily decreases over time due to them fighting obviously. Which is why most people have to bet on surviving the sure hit domain to defeat the enemy. Whereas Yuji surmises that Higuruma's domain is the old school type, meaning it isn't necessarily lethal and can't physically harm him if he sticks to the conditions that Higuruma explained beforehand. Continuing to explain, Higuruma says that both participants each have one chance to make a statement. Once both parties have made their case against each other, judgment will deliver a verdict. Yuji asks what happens if he's found guilty, but Higuruma isn't sure how to answer that question. Instead, he tells Yuji he has one of three options as a response. Silence, confession or denial. Surprised, Yuji asks if it's fine if he lies in court, to which Higuruma points out that there would be no need for trials if everyone was just honest in their first place. Then tells Yuji to hurry his slow ass up and make his statement because Judgman is impatient. Taking a moment, Yuji thinks about how to properly defend himself. He knows that he did go into the pachinko parlour that day, and even won on the machines. This means that line is his way to get off clean, but he isn't sure what the evidence is. After going over all of the hypotheticals, Yuji decides to go with the second option, which was confession, and claims that he only went inside the building to use the bathroom. However, Higuruma is a part of the goddamn Yu-Gi-Oh universe and had set up his trap. He instantly reveals it, retorting with the evidence, which turns out to be a damn photo of Yuji inside of the parlour using a cash exchange. Absolutely dumbfounded with his own stupidity, Yuji face palms, while Seto Kaiba himself adds that after gaining all of this evidence, it puts his supposed restroom story into question. Because of this, he states that he's certain Yuji entered the pachinko parlour with the intent of playing on the machines. Yuji, trying to be cheeky, asks the lawyer what law he's breaking then, to which he's explained that the premises forbids the entry of minors. Currently in Japan, there aren't any laws for actually punishing those minors over this, but it's still considered illegal. Puzzled, he states that this isn't an unfair trial. Puzzled, he states that this is an unfair trial because there's nothing he could have said to win. However, Higurumu reveals that Japan only forbids minors to gamble, meaning cash exchanges are separate entities in themselves. Because of this, if Yuji wanted to win the verdict, all he actually needed to say was that he'd never seen the pachinko parlor before. Having come to a conclusion, Judgment finds Yuji guilty, sentencing him to confiscation. Finally, we can stop with all the, the yip yip and get to the proper beatdown material. And like, y'all don't realise this, but after this fight here, we don't see Yuji for an extremely long time, so savour this fight before we move on to some of the newest and coolest characters in manga. Anyways, so randomly, the domain is dispelled and judgement disappears. As it does so, Higuruma immediately attacks by throwing his gavel, which connects with Yuji's arm, dealing way more damage than it should have. Smelling blood in the water, Higuruma closes the distance and summons his gavel back to his hand. He then charges it with cursed energy to increase its size and proceeds to smash through Yuji's defense, sending him crashing through several seats in the theater. Getting back up, Yuji realizes that he's in an even worse situation than originally thought. Now, he's completely lost the ability to manipulate cursed energy. But honestly, Higuruma probably got the worst matchup here as we all know for a fact that our boy's physical strength is so damn broken it's comparable to having a freaking heavenly restriction on himself. Continuing to attack, Higuruma launches and smashes down his mallet atop Yuji. Seeing it in time though, Yuji jumps back to avoid it, but this insanely big brain lawyer makes the gavel appear in his other hand allowing him to quickly attack yet again. After the barrage ends, Yuji, who had narrowly managed to dodge, tries to counterattack with an elbow. But Higuruma, instead of switching hands like he just was, now morphs the shape of the gavel into a flexible hook which manages to wrap around Yuji's elbow before tossing him away. It's actually crazy when you think about how strong Higuruma really is. Like this dude didn't have a curse technique up until extremely recently and only learned the basics of barrier techniques by analysing his own domain expansion. Somehow, this mad genius had worked back from there and gained an instinctive grasp of how to reinforce his body with curse energy. 
So somehow within just 12 days of awakening, Higuruma managed to blossom into a fighter who's comparable to someone like freaking Nanami or even Mei Mei, but probably even stronger. Before entering the colony, so literally for no point, he exercised a few cursed spirits and then soon after has eliminated at least 20 players becoming one of the two current front runners in terms of points. Standing there, he asks Yuji if he can't control his curse energy, which confuses him because he thinks Higuruma is the reason for it. But apparently, the confiscation penalty takes away the person's ability to use techniques in the first place. So because Yuji doesn't possess any kind of technique, the effects literally fail to stopping him from utilizing curse energy altogether. Concerned over this, Higuruma quickly surmises that it must be due to an incredible physical prowess. Determined to crush Yuji with all of his might, Higuruma shifts his gavel into a staff and attacks with a flurry of swings. Using his insane agility though, Yuji is able to avoid each swing then grabs onto the staff's middle section only for Higuruma to make it then instantly vanish before he can pull it away. Jumping back, Yuji then kicks the bathtub directly towards the lawyer, however he simply destroys it with his gavel unleashing a rush of water and broken tub pieces. Erupting through the water, Higuruma increases his gavel to a freaking massive size and slams it down on top of Yuji. However, like someone please explain to me how even this isn't enough to crush Yuji. It even freaking impresses Higuruma who compares his experience to fighting an indestructible doll. Yuji who realizes that he's in deep water though considers Higuruma's technique to be exceptionally strong and thinks that this must also mean that there's some sort of relative weakness. He frantically recalls his interactions beforehand and remembers the mental notes he made about the trial based curse technique. Then, in a moment that blows even me away every time I read it, Yuji calls out and demands a retrial. Like, how does he even know what this is in the first place? Because of this, it instantly transports them both inside of the domain to some sort of momentary safety. Due to what happened in the previous trial, if Yuji doesn't confess his guilt outright, he can request a retrial that can't be refused. Yet this play of his utterly backfires, as in this new trial, Judgment announces that our boy is being accused of mass murder in Shibuya on October the 31st, 2018. Then, like last time, Higuruma receives some evidence to go over, but before he even has the chance to speak, Yuji immediately confesses his guilt. As we all know by now, he won't, let alone can't lie, and will refuse to deny what happened, shocking the lawyer. Bleeding from his eyes with rage, the irate judgment declares Yuji is guilty. He punishes Yuji with confiscation again, as well as an additional punishment, which turns out to be no other than the freaking death penalty. So for those of you who are wondering, yes this is the third time now that a boy has been sentenced to death in some kind of manner. After judgment gives Yuji his penalty, Higuruma's gavel transforms into an executioner's sword, which has the added effect of being able to kill its target with just one cut. Higuruma believes, emphasizing with people means understanding all of their weaknesses, but he can't help but perceive that fragility itself as ugly. Including Yuji, everyone is weak and ugly to himself regardless of their aspirations to improve in life. While Higuruma continues screaming, Yuji tries to keep him back by launching several theater chairs in his direction. Then being his cheeky old self, Yuji throws his Jujutsu hijacker to distract Higuruma, leaving him a moment to get in and behind him. Quickly, Higuruma turns, but in that moment, also notices Yuji, who now throws his hoodie and manages to block the lawyer's sight momentarily. Dropping to the floor, Yuji throws a sweeping kick, but Higuruma, who's somehow able to keep up, is able to just jump above it. As he floats there, Higuruma prepares to land his final blow with the executioner's sword, while Yuji below prepares to land an uppercut. In the usual manga fashion though, we get absolutely cucked as it goes away into a past conversation between Mr. Yoshikawa and our current mentally insane lawyer. There, Higuruma refuses to become a judge because he felt like his ambitions in life weren't good enough. It's explained that he's reminded of his memory because Yuji, for some bizarre reason, confessed to a crime he did not commit. The evidence in the retrial was about Sakuna's massacre, and Higuruma knows that Yuji wasn't the one who committed that crime, so he can't seem to understand why Yuji would confess to something that he didn't do. Because of his confusion over this, Higuruma willingly deactivates the executioner's sword, allowing Yuji's insanely strong uppercut, like this is just pure physical strength by the way, like look how ripped he is right now boys. This punch directly hits him in the body, probably cracking a rib or two, and sending him crashing back into the seats. Before he even bothers to get up from the hit, Higuruma states to Yuji that the absence of reason or control signifies non-components. He adds that Sukuna was in possession of the body, and since Yuji didn't surrender control willingly, he is innocent. Yuji doesn't see it that way though, and he still claims responsibility for it, believing that death really only occurred because he's too weak. 
Yuji, who's still confused over why he deactivated his technique in the first place, asks him so. Getting back up now, Higuruma explains that he remembered why he got into law in the first place, as there are still other weak people out there who need his help. Higuruma invites Yuji to sit down after he's gotten his clothes back on and agrees to give him his 100 points. However, before he does so, he asks the young sorcerer if he's ever killed anyone on purpose, to which Yuji somberly responds that he has. Then, in a quick flash, we see the moments preceding Keita's trial and how Higuruma had brutally murdered the prosecutor and judge. Thinking on this, he asks Yuji if he felt awful about it as well. So, that there officially brings the first beat down of this like amazing col of this amazing colony to an end. But one thing I do want to say is I goddamn love Higuruma and I really really hope that he sticks around in the story after this point. Even after the killing game like ends it would be nice to have him as a great addition to like the Jujutsu tech staff. Honestly I think he is just truly a good person who is blinded by just how shit society is and his insane increase in power that he just received from Kenjaku. Which makes me also wonder, are all these new techniques and what modern day civilians have found themselves with actually just another reincarnation and instead of a person being reincarnated it's technically a curse technique itself that's being placed inside of an individual who meets the right conditions. Anyways, now that the two are just chilling out, Higuruma tells his co-game to add a new rule to the culling game that allows players to transfer points between one another. As Yuji anxiously waits, Kogain relays the message to the Game Master, but just moments later, he breathes a sigh of relief as the rule is allowed and Higuruma transfers one of his points to Yuji so that neither of them will be affected by curse technique removal for at least 19 days. Abruptly getting up now and leaving, Higuruma says goodbye, but Yuji, who's just like, yo wait up dude, asks him what he's going to do now. He explains to him that he wants to use Higuruma's strength to help them in the culling game, but the lawyer explains that he killed a few people before coming to Tokyo. Due to how he feels about this now, he wants to take responsibility and plans to turn himself in once the barriers reopen. But until that time happens, he's going to ponder his best course of action and doesn't feel comfortable staying around Yuji because it just makes him hate himself even more. Sadly, Higuruma leaves the theatre, leaving our boy alone to lament over the situation despite accomplishing his goal. Now we move on to the next round of Heat Boys, second massive battle of this dope ass arc here. I don't know if you've seen like Gege's recent post to do with Hanahana and him honoring Tagashi Sensei's ethereal level of writing, but dude said he hoped he could warm the pages to a similar degree to Tagashi Sensei's writing in years to come. I don't like actually believe how humble this goat is. Like, I, I, he doesn't realize he's already setting his pages on freaking fire and has definitely become one of the hottest dudes on the block where they constantly releasing manga each week, especially in the western side of the world. Meanwhile, and over the other side of the Tokyo colony, Reggie commends Megami as he says he can already tell that the young man is strong just based on a Shikigami. Unbeknownst to Remy, Reggie was actually just using her to lure in potential allies and now seeing Megami here, he asks him to join their group, then asks what he knows about the culling game. Without mentioning Master Thumb, Megami reveals that it is a ritual for bringing Japanese people to the other side so that they're no longer considered human. Hearing this explanation, Reggie cracks up and asks Megami if he knows Kenjaku, surprising the younger sorcerer as he had figured he'd run into a person with a connection to Kenjaku sooner or later. Reggie explains that the ritual explanation is probably just the cover for Kenjaku's real plan. And holy, I don't want to spoil anything, I want to like catch up and probably reveal like the true plan myself, because Reggie may look like a silly mofo, but this dude is a genius for stating this cheeky foreshadowing right here. Continuing with his big brain explanation, assuming that 1000 players were equally divided among 10 colonies, Reggie suggests that each colony of 100 players is top heavy in regard to the player's skill level. Players like Kashimo and Higuruma are much stronger than most most of the other combatants, and between the two of them, they have already eliminated roughly 60 players within just the first 12 days. Which makes sense to Megami as like the Tokyo Colony number one has been extremely quiet ever since he entered. He asks Reggie if all the strong have already weeded out all of the weak this early on in the game, and if the game has reached a deadlock due to those circumstances. Reggie confirms this, then goes on to explain that the transferal process isn't just a way to spread out players, but actually a way to stimulate a second awakening of new modern day people's curse techniques. Some of the weaker people even die during that transfer process, but this doesn't benefit the ritual in the same way that a drawn out merely would. 
Reggie then dropped a freaking bomb saying that Kenjaku is currently overseas in China, messing with the government officials there. So like, yo, was that Beijing? I don't know what Mr. Xi and his boys are doing over there. But anyways, he explains that he is pretty certain that Kenjaku will drop his own metaphorical bomb on all of the players once only the strongest ones remain. At that point, Reggie believes the Cullen game will have served its purpose. So for now, he's just focused on gathering strong allies and storing points. Megumi asks how Remy fits into his plan because he is obviously a weakling with no value. To which Reggie clarifies that Remy is useful for luring in people as they tend to drop their guard around a woman. Megumi asks Reggie if the total points of everyone in the group adds up to 100. To which Reggie confirms that they have over 100 points in total. Having been confirmed on his suspicions, Megumi reveals that a new rule will soon be added that allows players to give points to each other. He demands that Reggie and all of his allies hand over their points to him, and only then will he consider joining them. Immediately, Reggie is like, oh, oh well, I guess this talk is broken down, causing a random fodder player to shoot out behind Megami and try to attack him with a set of claw hands. So obviously this dude is another of the, the guys I like to call a body modification curse users. With Yuji, we had the cap dude and of course the rocket hair girl. Now we've got claw man right here. Megami manages to slip into the dude's shadow. Then as his divine dog attacks Reggie, he reappears from below the fodder claw man, picking him up and simply throwing his ass off the side of the building. As per usual though, Megami always double taps his opponents and commands Noe to dive bomb him, shocking the player and slamming him into the ground below, probably murking him. Back in the building, two kitchen knives are suddenly shoved into the divine dog's mouth, incapacitating the Shikigami. As Megami turns back, Reggie says that he knows what he's up to, and warns his adversary he'll die if he doesn't fight for real. On cue, a random eye suddenly appears over the side of the building next to Megami, and abruptly detonates causing an explosion which almost takes out even Reggie. Above them, we find a player named Iori Hazanoki, one of Reggie's allies and another of those body modification users. The now one-eyed sorcerer begins breaking off some more of his teeth while asking if their target is dead. However, Megami is seen quickly darting out of the smoke and immediately avoiding a follow-up attack sent by Remy. He manages to grab her hair and slams her onto the ground. Aggressively, he asks her if she's had enough, but before she can answer, Hazanoki jumps down from the floor above and tosses his teeth at Megami. At the same time, Reggie also sends through a few receipts that transform into gas and splash all over Megami, soaking him. Then, in some crazy ass combination with the gasoline, Hazanoki detonates his teeth, resulting in a massive blast that erupts through the top of the building, seemingly taking out both Remy and Megami. Exiting a room, Reggie asks if they're finished, but Hazanoki says he saw Megami duck into another room to avoid taking damage. Inside of that said room, Megami moves a door that he used to protect himself and Remy and asks her if she understands now, as the explosions could have easily killed her as well, proving that she's completely and utterly disposable. Megami tries to leave her behind, but Remy attempts to stab him again with her hair. Then instantly switching up, she desperately begs Megami to say that he likes her and that he will protect her. Disgusted, Megami realizes that Remy is the type of trash who only cares about words rather than someone's actions. Chizuru, so like remember that random dude Megami disposed of right at the start of the scuffle? Well, it turns out he didn't actually die and stupidly the man decides to rejoin the battle. He compliments Megami for getting the better of him before, but notes that the student must be in rough shape now. He mentions it was a pain scaling the building and hearing this Megami is like yo what are you, what are you dumb dude why didn't you take the stairs? Suddenly, both of their co-games appear and announce that a new rule has been added to the culling game. So this is obviously the point in the arc that Yuji and Higuruma's battle ends with him finally adding that new rule. Surprised and reinvigorated, Megami smiles. Instantly, he restarts the fight, kicking the fodder full back and summoning his prolific Max Elephant, which materializes inside of the building, completely destroying the upper floors as it comes thundering down. Sticking with lightning itself, Megami then uses Noe to catch himself, allowing him to mount Chizuru in mid-air. After getting on top and still falling, Megami slashes his face over and over with the hilt of his sword before jumping off and kicking him into the ground below. Having crashed heavily into the ground, Chizuru curses Megami. Yet, before he can even get up, Megami, who ain't no damn Yuji, simply slashes his face open with his sword and eliminates him. For a moment, Megami questions what he's doing because they'll need more points in the future, but quickly refocuses by reminding himself that Sukomi won't have to participate in the killing now. As Kogain rewards him with 5 points, Megami reaffirms to himself that he just needs to deal with the difficulties as they come. 
Descending down to ground level where their opponent is, Reggie is left surprised and even embarrassed by Chizuru's lack of skill. Back with our boy, he notices that he's still outnumbered 2 to 1 and is now feeling the effects of the first explosion. Thinking on what to do for a moment, he deduces that he can't flee or use his domain expansion because the environment still isn't compatible with his technique. Before he can think up of anything to do, Hazunoki abruptly spits out another one of his bomb teeth. But completely and utterly out of nowhere, someone literally no one saw coming showed up and took their blast face first like an actual champion to protect him. As all of them stand there utterly confused, the newcomer named Fumihiko Takaba, who was the failing comedian that I introduced right at the end of the previous Jujutsu Kaisen video, or it might even be the one before that one now. Well, he, in one of them like superhero level voices, states that two on one fights are unfair and calls Reggie and his minion completely cowards. He adds that their attacks have done zero damage, however it's shown that the attack completely busted open his face and head, making it clear that he was in fact hurt, confusing Megami. Looking at Megami, Takaba decides to help him, because their 35 year old can tell whether someone is good or bad, just by their face. Yet, after looking at him again, he realises that Megami actually has a bad face, but writes it off as all revisionist, which is just obviously wrong, he meant to say relative. Megami is just left stunned with this new person, but regardless of his personality, this random man just saved him, so the Jujutsu High student is willing to trust him for now. Reggie and Hazanoki don't even recognise Takaba, so they try asking what time period he's from. Takaba though, who isn't even listening to them, explains that his costume is based on a funny superhero, causing his intimidation factor to suddenly flare up while preparing to tell another absolutely terrible joke. The enemy duo prepare for an attack, but Takaba darts into a Jojo-esque pose and tells a joke that gets a dead silent reaction. Takaba screams that damn it's a tough crowd, but continues to hype himself up nonetheless. Even though his opponents are stiff, Takaba will continue to do what he does best because he's an entertainer of the highest degree. He screams, flying forward and delivering an insane double-footed flying dropkick that connects with Hazanoki's face, sending him crashing into a nearby building. Standing there, Reggie notes the shift in Takaba's output of curse energy and quickly realises that the failing comedian is actually super strong. Takaba, stunting on all of them, does a handstand while explaining that he's an old school performer who's pro-violence. Using the confusion to his advantage, Megami tries to launch a surprise attack on Reggie from his own shadow, but his foe manages to jump away from the ground in time to avoid it. Now back with his new teammate, Megami tries to explain to him Hazanoki's exploding body part, but only ends up getting annoyed, telling Takaba to stop getting so close to his face. Bringing out Kogame, they use him to confirm that Higuruma was indeed the one who added the new rule. He's surprised and is sure to see that Yuji had completed their mission. Because of this, he states that he's done with this colony and tells Reggie he'll let him go if he backs off. Reggie just straight up annoyed now, refuses because he needs to make up for his teammates lost points. Over in that absolutely ruined building, Hazanoki recovers from the dropkick that he just suffered and calls out to Zakaba. The comedian though, still just absolutely ignores him and instead introduces himself properly to Megami. Since Takaba is most likely going to end up killing the bomb guy, Megami requests that he take Hazanoki's points if possible, to which he accepts on the condition that he continues to entertain, as first and foremost, he is a performer. Satisfied, Takaba begins sparking, almost exposing himself to the young man, while Hazanoki in return sends an explosive eye directly at him. Not phase, Takaba simply knocks it away with a random paper fan, then manages to close the distance on his opponent, sliding in behind him and utterly destroying his rectum with Pervy Sage's infamous 1000 years of pain, sending his enemy into a severe bout of pain. Enraged and getting utterly fodderized, Hazanoki swings at him, but Takaba immediately follows up with a powerful kick to his dome that sends his opponent through another building. Standing there, Megami is left flabbergasted with Takaba's show of strength and expresses that he's glad he isn't his enemy. Twitch Takaba tells him to stay alive while he goes off and pounds his opponent some more. Over with Reggie, he stands there, thinking that Zakaba is toast either way, because Hazanoki will go all out after being mocked so much. With his objective complete, Megami tells his adversary to worry about himself so that he can fight him for real. Instantly, he summons his Max Elephant, leaving Reggie blown away that Megami has such a large Shikigami in his arsenal. Max Elephant attempts to spray Reggie with a torrent of water, but he somehow manages to dart away from the burst. Attempting to take him by surprise, Megami leaps from the building above, but Reggie notices in time and throws a receipt which transforms into a net and ensnares the recently created rabbits. Megami himself, though, narrowly avoids the net and jumps onto a chain linked fence to break his fall. As Megami jumps back into the road, Reggie activates his innate curse technique, contractual recreation, and transforms several receipts into kitchen knives. 
Those said knives fly forward towards Megami as projectiles, but he's able to deflect them with a blade of his own. Some rabbits are pierced by these knives, allowing Reggie to surmise that unlike the other Shikigami, they can reappear regardless of how many are destroyed. Reggie figures that Megami has likely figured out how his curse technique works. Due to this, he uses a receipt to recreate the contract and endows himself with a relaxing two-night stay at a five-star Japanese inn. In contrast, Megami is worn down from the constant fighting, on top of having used several Shikigami, lowering his overall capacity. Reggie surmises that Megami can't reconjure his Shikigami after they're injured, and without the flexibility the Divine Dog provides him, he's limited in his options. The old schooler adds that both of them lack big finishing moves and will need to pick away at each other over time to achieve victory. To which Megami is like, yeah nah bro, in that case I'm absolutely fucked so I'ma run for now. Out of nowhere, Noe then swoops down grabbing Megami. However, Reggie quickly summons the Trash Taste Boys drones, equipped with the lost luggage cameras to follow his opponents through the sky while he watches on a phone. Then summoning a moped, Reggie begins to pursue his adversary through the streets and tracks Megami's position to a gymnasium. Reggie questions whether he really tried escaping, or if he's in fact trying to lure the fight inside. Inside of the gym, Megumi is glad to see that the area is spacious. Looking up though, he suddenly sees Reggie appear on the balcony, who asks what his opponent is plotting. Megumi replies that Big Reggie is likely planning something as well, and the latter claims that it's hard to tell because sorcerers are nothing but con artists. Which is completely and utterly true, and I love the whole idea of Reggie's thoughts on sorcerers here. It's all about like conning your enemy into believing you've played your final move, but actually you've just laid a trap and conned him into a false sense of security. Anyways, let the main part of this absolutely insane battle begin. Suddenly, two trucks appear out of nowhere and come crashing through the walls of the building. Acting quickly, Megami is just able to slip under the vehicles, yet as he watches them crash into the other wall, two potted plants are recreated above Megami that drop down onto his head, cracking his skull open. Reggie follows up by repeatedly slicing Megami's back and left arm with a small knife. Megami tries to retreat, but gets distracted by the unorthodox projectile Reggie had just created. He's taken off guard when the silly old carrot begins to break apart and reveals a hidden kitchen knife inside. Shooting forth, the knife stabs directly into Megami's elbow, while Reggie then follows up with a brutal front kick to his face. Having been knocked down, Megami slides across the gym floor, thoroughly overpowered. It's explained that the things Reggie recreates behave like Shikigami. Obviously knives and other things like that can't normally fly through the air, but Reggie is able to get them to do so with a single command. Big freaking Megami though, a man made of a much darker material responds by stating that barrier techniques are difficult for him, and he's simply unable to make an artificial environment over a real one. However, Megami doesn't need to physically create a barrier. No, instead he can use the entire gymnasium as a perfect space for his domain. As planned, Megami casts his goddamn domain expansion, the insane Chimera Shadow Garden, and forcibly encloses the barrier around the gym to trap Reggie inside, sealing his fate. Reggie, who really didn't think Megami was a sorcerer capable of using domain expansion, is utterly taken by surprise. Immediately though, he activates his special anti-domain technique called Hollow Wicker Basket, which if you've seen my video going over like all of the JJK barrier types, you know that this is the original form of the current simple domain. Reggie believes he successfully protected himself from the domain until four toads appear from the liquid below his feet and wrap up both his legs with their tongues. Confused, Reggie doesn't understand how he's been hit after using Hollow Wicker Basket. It's explained that technically Reggie's technique does nullify the said guaranteed hit from a domain. But because Big Old Megami's domain isn't complete and doesn't actually have a can't miss attack, it only serves as an extension to his cursed energy and 10 shadows technique. That soul imperfection has taken Reggie off guard and Megami notices his expression change. Before Reggie can finish berating Megami for getting cocky, he's ambushed by two shadow clones. Reggie is unable to avoid the barrage of hits due to the toad's tongues preventing his movements. After getting pummeled over and over, Reggie falls back to the ground and summons combat knives to sever the toad's tongues. Free to move again, he summons a machete and prepares the counter attack. However, Megami's clone prevents Reggie from gaining any momentum by coming up from below to grab his leg. Then the clone throws Reggie towards Megami's main body, who's also armed with his sword and already bringing it down on Reggie. Somehow though, Reggie is able to block this attack like his reflexes are literally insane here, but now the only reverse card's been played by our boy, and it's a 3 on 1 with the other shadow clone appearing and elbowing him directly in the dome. Heavily damaged now, Reggie just narrowly defends a slash from Megami and commends the sorcerer for his increased function of the curse technique, considering it worse than a lethal domain. 
Reggie is aware that if Megami uses Max Elephant and showers him with water, he'll lose this fight. Refusing to allow that to happen, he activates his curse technique and releases a multitude of receipts into the air above his head. Megami tries to destroy the receipts using Nui, but it's just not quick enough to stop Reggie's contractual recreation from activating. Three cars are suddenly generated from the receipts, which drop straight into the shadowy floor. Reggie understands that the entire domain is Megami's shadow, but notice that Megami has only kept one curse tool on him for the length of this entire fight. He theorizes that this is because Megami has to bear the weight of anything kept within his shadow, and now Reggie is using the cars to turn the domain's conditions back on Megami. Having been forced to the ground under the immense weight, Reggie believes Megami might be able to summon Shikigami still, so he keeps his guard up and plans to keep on piling weight until his opponent is completely crushed. Megami though, like we all learnt this throughout the first battle against that silly old cursed womb, he literally is insane and the dude does not care about life anymore, to the point that he tells Reggie he's forgotten something important. He reminds him that an incomplete domain is still a domain, and there is shadow all around the both of them. Megami, who doesn't care, suddenly conjures Max Elephant from the shadows above Reggie, causing the massive Shikigami to drop down directly on top of him. Having turned their fight into a 10 weightlifting competition, Megumi remains confident as he asks Reggie which of the two of them will be crushed first. It's explained that the average human being can withstand about 5 to 6 units of G-force before losing consciousness. Megumi weighs 60 kilograms and is currently carrying 2.4 tons of weight, which equates to 40 units of G-force. A fully matured elephant weighs 3 to 6 tons, and Megumi's domain increases the precision of his curse technique, replicating Max Elephant's weight realistically. With that intense weight falling atop him, Reggie fractures his right fibula and heel bone due to the pressure alone. He then laments over not saving the trucks he used earlier for more weight at this moment. He's been soaked with water by Max Elephant, but there are still receipts he can release, including the special ace that he has up his sleeve. Reggie wonders if he can enter the shadow below him to release his ace and finish off Megami. He dismisses this idea though, because anything caught in the shadow after it's dispelled might be unable to escape. Furthermore, he's unsure of what it's actually like inside of the sticky shadowy substance. He decides this option is too risky and tries to withstand the elephant's weight while releasing his ace attack. Reggie attempts to hold up the elephant with one arm while taking out another receipt, but before he can fully activate his contractual recreation, Reggie succumbs to Max Elephant's immense weight and falls into the shadow below him. Without any buoyancy or resistance inside of the shadow, Reggie falls and begins to lose consciousness due to the lack of oxygen. Laying there above his likely defeated opponent, Megami waits until he's sure that Reggie is dead before dispelling the domain and emptying his shadow. Suddenly, and coming back like a damn king riding one of his cars, Reggie flies back, exploding through to the surface. Rescued from certain demise now, he commends Megami's strength and admits he's a strong sorcerer before immediately stating that he's even stronger though. He activates another contractual recreation and summons a small, two-story freaking wooden house that weighs at least 30 tons to crush Megami. In the next second, Megami makes an extremely drastic move. Despite using his ace, Reggie somehow abruptly finds himself underwater again and being strangled from behind. As explained now, Megami is using his extreme weight to drown Reggie, but because of just the immense force that's being placed on him, he has to deactivate the curse technique and unregister the weight of the objects before he does actually end up dying himself. Coming to, Reggie is able to swim back to the surface and realizes that he's inside of a pool on the basement level of the gymnasium. Megami fled back into his shadow and entered the domain, making it so that the house broke the floor and forced Reggie into the pool below. It's unclear how Megami was able to move despite the immense weight, but Reggie theorizes that he did so by ejecting himself from the shadow, kind of like a seesaw. Megami strolls up on his opponent and tells Reggie his receipts are too wet to use now. Normally, splashing the receipts with water isn't enough to make the print fade, so that alone isn't enough to stop Reggie from reducing things. However, soaking the receipts prevents Reggie from fulfilling the condition that requires burning of the receipts. Reggie also notes that Megumi can't summon Shikigami anymore, to which the sorcerer agrees, stating that from now on, this is a straight up physical fight to the death. Reggie though doesn't actually believe this, he expects Megumi to summon a Shikigami and plans on countering Megumi as soon as he lets up. Darting in, Reggie's initial bait attack gets palmed off, but as he planned, he uses that momentum to send Megami's sword arm bouncing back. Having no defense left, Reggie lets loose with a multitude of kicks, smashing the young sorcerer over and over again. Megami admits that Reggie is a tough opponent, made evident by his ability to withstand Max Elephant. He's also a talented martial artist with some really dope ass techniques, but he just isn't fast enough. 
Just before Reggie is able to land a direct hit on Megami, a portion of the far left side of Reggie's face, his ear, and much of his left shoulder are completely sheared off by someone he thought that he'd dealt with already. Having suffered a lethal blow at blinding speed, Reggie looks back to see no one other than the divine dog, Totality, which is just pissed at him, like the dog even has two scars in its nose from the knives. It's explained that Megami was waiting until Reggie had completely dismissed the dog, and hearing this, Reggie repeats that a sorcerer is indeed nothing but a con artist as he collapses to the ground in a pool of his own blood. Reggie lays bleeding out on the ground, looking up at Megami, and realizes that the domain and the pool concealed that Megami could still strike with his divine dog. Megami didn't flee into the gym using Nui, instead he'd lured Reggie inside. Standing above him, Megami inquires as to what Reggie's relationship to Master Tenken is. It's shown that there really isn't much of a relationship, he only knows him as the hermit who is immortal and isn't surprised to find out he's still alive at this time. Defeated with dignity, Reggie tells his co-gang to transfer all 41 of his points to Megami, which our boy is a little annoyed about, but Reggie tells him to just consider it a good deed before death. He adds that he's just a spectator and isn't close to Kenjaku at all. With his final words said, Reggie tells his executioner to let fate toy with him before he also dies like a fool. Moments later, Megumi receives 5 points for the death of Reggie Star. Damn, it's actually such a firefight. Like, I love how much foreshadowing for future events are peppered throughout the story here. Like, is that how Megumi is going to end up dying? Having Sukuna, who is fate in this context, I guess, toy with him before he kills him like a fool. And again, those who are, like, past chapter 200 now also know Big Reggie was correct when it came to this just being the beginning of something even larger. Back to the fight over the other side of the city, a massive explosion is set off on the roof of a building. Hazanuki, who's still fighting with Takaba, wonders if he's finally hit his target, yet the comedian appears right beside him and comically encourages him to stay focused because his opponent is a tough one. Continuously irritated by Takaba's antics, Hazanuki tries to punch him, only for his fist to slide off this new dude's weird saucy coating. Hazanuki is just really frustrated by this fight as he doesn't understand why Takaba won't take any damage regardless of how many times he gets bombed. Kogen interrupts their battle for a moment to inform them both that Reggie has been eliminated. Surprised, Hazanoki decides to walk away from the fight entirely. Initially, Takaba is fine with this, telling his opponent to bathe and brush his teeth once he gets home, but after thinking for a moment and sticking with the original plan, Takaba starts to pester Hazanoki for his points, only to be repeatedly denied. As it skips away from them, it's explained that Big Fumihiko's curse technique is called Comedian. It's actually like too broken of a technique, so broken in fact that it has the possibility to even rival that of Gojo's. Like anything that Takaba thinks is kind of funny or is funny in general becomes reality itself for him. But unfortunately, you know Takaba is a little bit mentally lacking and is completely unaware of how this even works. Elsewhere, she's distressed because she's always been told throughout her life that men are supposed to be wolves who would tear her up, but they've always come to take care of her. Which is, what do you mean by getting torn up? In, in New Zealand, that's some crazy ass slang. Anyways, she doesn't know how to go on and still thinks that wolves will continue to help her until she's cornered by a deadly hound which turns out to be Megami's divine dog. Before Megami can make good on his threats, Takumi's voice randomly appears and tells her brother to stop before he kills someone in cold blood, causing his divine dog to disappear and Remy surprised that she's been let go. Annoyed and just completely exhausted now, Megami tells his sister to just shut up before he collapses to the ground unconscious. Just as this happens though, like literally something I didn't even think like happened throughout this arc happens. No one other than the angel herself, Hana Kurusu, descends upon his body. So that officially brings us to the very end of what is Tokyo Colony number no. 1 from Jujutsu Kaisen. Obviously this arc here is absolutely insane, but then again half the arc is literally just either meeting new people or just having like the explanations of their techniques explained to us before they end up either leaving or end up dying. So I hope they, you know, like end up playing some kind of role later in the story. We know now like for a fact that Reggie's role or like the stuff that Reggie kind of said ends up playing a role later in the story. So it's good to know that not everything from his character was like absolutely useless and that's kind of why if you 
noticed I put out a video like a week ago going over how I thought Reggie and his fight against Megami was the most underrated fight from throughout the Culling game in Jujutsu Kaisen. Just merely for the fact that when it first came out everyone thought it was utter trash and they didn't enjoy it and they hated the, the action in comparison to what was going on beforehand. But now you can see that the action that actually went down here and the stuff between Megami and Reggie is an extremely important factor to what is going currently on in the story. Or to what is going on currently in the story. Well obviously if you have enjoyed this arc here the next arc is the Sendai colony number no number one on that one because there isn't two of them there's only one Sendai colony and then after that we have the Tokyo colony number two with our boy freaking Hikari going up against Hajime Kashimo who was the other character teased way back in like the preparation arc I'm pretty sure so a while ago now but you've got those videos to look forward to up in the future along with a bunch of other Chainsaw Man videos and all of that but anyway if you guys are new around here and want to watch more stuff just like this then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video as it really helps out with pushing my content to a bunch of new amazing people. But anyway, enough of that. For now, it's been your professional degenerate Diavolo, and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.